Welcome to video 8 of ICJ's course on litigating before UN treaty bodies. In this video, we'll examine the last stage of the proceedings, namely the implementation of a positive decision from a treaty body. Even though this comes at the end of the litigation process, implementation of a treaty body's decision, also called views, is a crucial stage of the procedure and we need to consider already at the outset what measures we could take to push for the implementation of a potentially positive decision. We mentioned before that many states do not consider decisions by the treaty bodies as legally binding. However, they are an authoritative interpretation of the state's treaty obligations. In addition, by accepting the communications procedure and the treaty body's competence to issue decisions, state parties are required to act in good faith and comply with decisions from treaty bodies. There is no appeal against committee decisions and generally their decisions on the merits are final. If the treaty body has decided that there has not been any violation of the treaty in question, the case is closed and there is no further follow-up. All committees request states parties to provide information on the implementation of their decisions where they do find that a violation has occurred. Some have developed certain so-called follow-up procedures to specifically monitor whether state parties have implemented their requests for remedies. Where the committee in question has decided that the facts as submitted by the complainant disclose a violation by the state party, it issues a set of recommendations or measures of reparation it requests the state to implement. We considered these measures in the last video number seven. The relevant committee then invites the state party to provide information within a fixed time frame, usually six months, on the steps it has taken or plans to take to give effect to the committee's findings and recommendations. As part of the follow-up process, some committees have appointed committee members as special rapporteur for the follow-up of views, and it is that special rapporteur who will be liaising with the parties on follow-up. The Special Rapporteur can also support states with implementation of a positive decision. If the state party does not respond at all on implementation, the committees may leave the case open and keep it under consideration. Where it does respond, the state's response is shared with the victim or the legal representative for further comments. For example, within the Committee on the Elimination of Discrimination Against Women, the CEDAW Committee, a specific working group deals with follow-up of individual cases, with members acting as follow-up rapporteurs in cases where the dialogue with the state about implementation is ongoing. They hold regular implementation meetings in which the working group seeks to assist the state parties with implementation. The complainant is usually involved and regularly updated about state responses and can also make relevant submissions. The committee then uses so-called assessment grades to measure progress in implementation, ranging from A for satisfactory measures to B for partly satisfactory, C for unsatisfactory to E for no measures taken at all. These follow-up reports are public and the CEDAW committee may also issue a press release to raise awareness and increase visibility of the committee's work on individual cases. Some committees, like the Human Rights Committee or the Committee Against Torture, are also mandated to go on an implementation mission to the state party concerned to discuss implementation directly with the competent authorities. What can we do to encourage implementation? As mentioned before, implementation of treaty bodies' decisions remains relatively low and some years ago was estimated to be at around 24% of all positive decisions rendered by treaty bodies. It is so low for several reasons. State parties may not consider themselves bound by decisions of the treaty bodies and lack sufficient political will to implement, or decisions may lack specificity to provide guidance to states on how best to implement or to measure full implementation. In addition, full implementation may take many years and therefore it is difficult to assess in terms of statistics whether or not a decision has been fully implemented. Until relatively recently, litigants before the treaty bodies also paid less attention to implementation and focused more on receiving a positive decision from the treaty bodies, thereby letting states get away more easily with non-implementation. The low rate of implementation 
and the fact that treaty bodies are chronically under-resourced to dedicate more time to the implementation process make it even more important for complainants, their legal representatives and other relevant actors to work towards the implementation of a decision. It might be the only chance for victims to obtain tangible reparation and has significant potential to contribute to broader change, one of the overall goals of a strategic litigation process. After all, a perfect rate of implementation of treaty bodies' decisions would mean tangible change for many individuals and a significantly improved human rights record across countries, making violations in the future less likely. Implementation depends on many factors and there is no one-size-fits-all approach. Much depends on the political context in the country concerned and the type of violations committed as well as the remedies requested by the treaty bodies. There are various steps we can take and include in developing an implementation strategy, always in close consultation with the complainant where they want to be involved. These steps include working in a network of support. As mentioned in video 2, it is usually best to work in a network of support. This is because full implementation often takes a long time, adding on to an already lengthy litigation process. It also may require different types of expertise and experience in domestic and international law, advocacy, policy, media and communication, as well as community mobilization. You may want to consider to enforce a positive decision through litigation in the relevant state party where that is a possibility. In some cases, complainants took a positive decision from a treaty body to the domestic courts to enforce compliance. In one case, for example, the CEDAW committee had found that Spain had violated the Convention on the Elimination of Discrimination Against Women in failing to protect the complainant and her daughter from domestic violence, ultimately resulting in the daughter being killed by her father. The committee ordered Spain to pay compensation to the complainant and to reform domestic legislation to better protect against domestic violence. The complainant then took the decision to the Spanish courts to enforce compliance with the CEDAW committee's decision and litigated enforcement all the way up to the Spanish Supreme Court. The Supreme Court ordered payment of 600,000 euro compensation to the complainant for moral damages she suffered and also found that decisions of UN treaty bodies are binding in nature. In several countries, specific national follow-up mechanisms exist for the effective implementation of UN treaty bodies' decisions. These can help with the enforcement of compensation awards and law reform. In a case against Georgia, for example, where the CEDAW committee ordered compensation to two complainants for violations of the convention, the national follow-up mechanism helped the complainants to actually receive the compensation requested by the committee. We can carry out advocacy and engage the treaty body. Civil society organizations can also support implementation through making relevant submissions to the treaty body about the lack of progress of implementation and generally liaising with the special rapporteur and follow-up to keep them up to date about implementation. This can be important to counter any state submission arguing that a decision has been implemented and that a case should be closed. It also helps to keep the pressure on the state. Keeping the committee informed will also be important to allow the committee to directly engage the state on its lack of implementation. Domestic level advocacy in most cases will be important to get the state to implement or even respond to a treaty body decision. You may want to work with civil society organizations to carry out such advocacy, which can include engagement of the national parliament, the National Human Rights Commission, relevant decision and policy makers, as well as UN offices in your country or in your region to put pressure on the government to implement. You could also raise any concerns about non-implementation with relevant embassies to bring up the case in their engagement with the government. As mentioned, in the majority of cases, the treaty body will request the state party to publish and disseminate a positive decision. Where the government in question fails to do so, you may want to integrate publication of and awareness raising about the decision in your communication strategy around implementation. This may further contribute to providing satisfaction to the victim and help in putting pressure on the government to implement the decision. 
Prioritization can be important. When developing your implementation strategy, you may want to consider whether the recommendations requested by the treaty body should be addressed in a priority order, taking into account, for example, the needs of the victim and their perspectives on what should be prioritized, the likelihood of implementation and resources and expertise available to work on implementation of specific measures. A positive finding from the treaty bodies will in many cases already go a long way in providing some measure of justice to victims and be one of the main reasons for filing a case with the treaty bodies. As such, the finding of state responsibility in and of itself will already have an impact and meet victims' rights to justice and to truth to some extent. However, such a finding also presents an important opportunity to go further and it is arguably only after having received such a decision that the real work starts. A positive decision is truly meaningful when it leads to tangible results for the victim and has an impact on broader society. This brings me to the end of video 8 and this course by ICJ on litigating before UN treaty bodies. We need more cases from the MENA region to be litigated before treaty bodies, as the region is currently underrepresented regarding the number of cases, but also in terms of the number of violations being committed throughout the region. I hope this is a useful resource in addition to the reading material suggested for each lecture, so please do check the notes for each video. ICJ will be able to provide further information, and I hope there will be more cases from the region before UN treaty bodies, and to have the opportunity to work on some of those cases with you in the future. Thank you.